Welcome to lecture 20, the residue theorem. It's entitled Integrating with the Calculus of Residues. We're going to be going through three explicit examples. So let's talk about the residue theorem. We've kind of mentioned this and you've sort of been using it, but let's really uh, determine precisely what the residue theorem is. So let's recall that the Laurent expansion includes a term that behaves like a constant divided by z minus z0. And when you have such a term, we say that the function has a pole at z0 with a residue given by whatever the constant b underscore minus 1 or b sub minus 1 is for that Laurent expansion term, which goes like b minus 1 divided by z minus z0. So you clearly see that's a function that has a singularity. The function becomes infinite when z approaches z0. And the strength of the infinity is given by b to the minus 1. We also know that when we integrate around a closed path around this curve, it's only that term that's going to contribute to the integral because we integrated every other power, and we know that the integral of every other power is equal to 0. So if we integrate this Lorentz series around a curve that's a closed curve, the only contribution comes from the pole, and the result of it is just 2 pi i times the strength of the pole, b sub minus 1 if the curve that surrounds the pole completely encircles the pole and winds around it once in the counterclockwise direction. And so this then gives us the residue theorem, which simply says that the integral over a closed path that surrounds a curve, a function g of z, is equal to 2 pi i times the sum over all of the poles of g that lie inside the interior of the curve gamma of the residue at each pole of g that lies inside the curve gamma. So we just sum up the residues of each of those poles, multiply by 2 pi i, and that equals the integral. So what we have to do is we have to find all the poles inside and as we said multiply by 2 pi i uh, times the residues and sum them all up. Now this result actually allows us to evaluate a wide range of different integrals and it becomes a very powerful tool in your arsenal for calculating integrals and it's one that you've never seen before and so we're going to be spending some time exploring this. So we're going to start with an example that we already know. We've already gone through and done this example and done this integral it's the integral of 1 over 1 plus z to the fourth over a semicircle, and we're going to pick r equals 2 so that we enclose the place where the poles of this function lie. And we did it last time by finding the partial fraction expansion for 1 over 1 plus z to the fourth. And here instead we're going to identify the residues. We're going to find the poles and determine the residues at each of the poles. So how do I find the poles? Well, I have to find the four roots to z to the fourth equals minus 1, because when I find those, then the denominator is equal to 0. It's easy to calculate them. They satisfy z sub n is the exponential of i pi times n over 2 plus 1 fourth, where n is going to be 0, 1, 2, or 3. And you can see that all of those poles lie on the unit circle. Now, only two of them lie on the inside of the semicircle, as indicated in blue in the figure to the left. How do we calculate the residue? Well, we have to evaluate the limit as z approaches the pole, or the root, z sub n, z minus z sub n divided by, or multiplied by the function. And what's going to happen is that z minus z to the n is going to cancel the z minus z to the n that is in the denominator of that Laurent expansion, and it's going to leave for me b to the minus 1. The only time this isn't going to work is if there are higher order singularities at the point z to the minus n. Then the calculation of the residue gets more complicated. But if there are just isolated poles, we call them simple poles, and essentially all of the problems you're going to be working on are going to deal with simple poles, then this formula that's given here will be a formula that works in determining precisely what the residue is. So how do I evaluate this? As z approaches z to the n, the numerator goes to 0 and the denominator go to 0. So I have to use L'Hopital's rule. And so we just differentiate the numerator. That's going to give me a 1. And we differentiate the denominator. That's going to give me 4 
z cubed, and then I have to evaluate it at z equals z to the n, and so I get that the residue is just 1 over the quantity for zn cubed. Okay, great, we found the residue. Now, the residue theorem says we have to multiply those residues by 2 pi i and sum them. Well, there are two residues, one at z0 and one at z1, so I get 2 pi i, 1 over 4 z0 cubed plus 1 over 4 z1 cubed. Now, if I recall that zn to the fourth power is equal to minus 1, I can replace 1 over z cubed by minus z. So please convince yourself that that is the case. And so this residue, the 1 over 4 cancels the 2 and gives me pi i over 2. Uh, there's a minus sign in this conversion to bringing the z's upstairs. And so I get minus pi i over 2, z0 plus z1. All right, let's look at these two residues. Clearly, you can see that the real parts, when I add them together, are going to cancel because one is a positive real part, the other is a negative real part. The imaginary parts are going to add. It's a positive imaginary part. And because it's at 45 degrees, I know the imaginary part goes like 1 over the square root of 2. So I have two of them. So I get 2 over the square root of 2, which is just square root of 2, and it's multiplied by i. Well, the i times the minus i is going to give me 1. And the uh, square root of 2 divided by 2 is going to give me 1 over square root of 2 in the, in the denominator. So I'm going to find that the result of this is going to be pi divided by the square root of 2. And that is indeed the result that we got the first time we did the integral by doing the expansion and partial fractions. Now whether or not you think this method of residues is easier, I think it is because expanding and partial fractions was really quite painful to do for this problem, uh, or whether you don't believe it is is really a personal taste, but you will find there are many problems that really the residue method is the only way that you can get the answer. Okay, let's look at our second example. In our second example, we extend this integral that we've already solved into an arbitrary even power, and we're doing the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity along the real axis. So this involves the exact same integral as we had before, but we have to take the limit as the radius goes to infinity, and then we have to recognize that the integral over the circular arc part is going to go to zero as that radius goes to infinity. So we're really left with just the integral over the real axis. But because we're integrating over this entire curve, we still have to look at what are all the poles inside the curve. They all lie on the unit circle, and they're of the form that's given here. z sub m is equal to e to the i pi m over n plus 1 over 2n. And a number of them, when m runs from 0 to n minus 1, all lie inside that semicircle. They lie in the upper half plane. And now we have to calculate the residue. We use the same exact formula we used before, z minus z to the m over 1 plus z to the 2n in the limit z approaches z to the m. Once again, this is singular, so we have to use L'Hopital's rule. And we get 1 over 2n z to the 2n minus 1 uh, evaluated at zm. And using the identity, once again, that z to the 2n is equal to minus 1, I can write that as minus zm over 2n. And that's the residue. That's all that it takes. So the residue theorem then tells us that the integral is 2 pi i times the sum of those residues. Well, I have a minus sign and I have a 1 over 2n, so it becomes minus pi i over n times the sum m equals 0 to n minus 1 of zm. And zm is given for you in that equation. It's just e to the i pi m over n plus 1 over 2n. Now, if you look carefully at this, I can factor out at e to the i pi over 2n. That's just a constant. I can factor that constant out. And if I called y equals e to the i pi over n, you see that's a sum of y raised to the nth power. It looks just like a geometric series, but it ends at a finite number. Nevertheless, if I multiply by 1 minus y, I can actually sum that series. We did that when we did the proof of what the geometric series was earlier in the course. And so this is the method we're going to use to summing the problem. So let's look carefully at all of those steps. So 
I'm going to first factor out that term, e to the i pi over 2n, and then I'm going to recognize that the sum is equal to 1 minus y raised to the nth power divided by 1 minus y. Well, y raised to the nth power is just e to the i pi, and e to the i pi is just minus 1. So that numerator is going to be 1 minus minus 1. It's going to just become 2. And then I'm left with 1 minus e to the i pi over n in the denominator. What I'm going to do is I'm going to rationalize that denominator by multiplying by 1 minus e to the minus i pi over n divided by 1 minus e to the minus i pi over n. And now you see if I take that exponential factor that was factored out and multiply it by the numerator, I'm going to get e to the i pi over 2n minus e to the minus i pi over 2n. And that's just equal to 2i sine pi over 2n. For the denominator, when I multiply things out, I get a 1 when the 1 multiplies the 1. I get a 1 when the e to the i pi over n multiplies the e to the minus i pi over n. And then I get the two cross terms, which end up being minus 2 cosine pi over n. Please carefully write this out and work it out. Make sure that you agree that that's the case. So the denominator becomes 2 minus 2 cosine pi over n. Now there are a couple of factors of 2 that can be factored out. There's a factor of i that can be factored out. And so we simplify this, we get 2 pi over n sine of pi over 2n divided by 1 minus cosine pi over n. And now I'm going to use the double angular formula to write cosine pi over n as cosine squared pi over 2n minus sine squared pi over 2n. And so I get a 1 minus cosine squared pi over 2n plus sine squared pi over 2n in the denominator. But 1 minus cosine squared is equal to sine squared, so I get a 2 sine squared. I can cancel one of the factors of sine from the numerator to the denominator. I can cancel the factor of 2, and I'm left with pi divided by n sine pi over 2n. And that is indeed what we got before. So we've shown that we can use the method of residues in order to evaluate this integral as well. And indeed, this really is the only way to evaluate this integral. Trying to do partial fractions for this uh, particular function would be ridiculously difficult to be able to carry out. Okay, we have one more example. This is an example of sort of a generic kind of integral that we can evaluate. Typically integrals from 0 to pi or 0 to 2 pi of things that involve sines or cosines, they often can be mapped onto integrals that can be evaluated by residues. So in this case, we're going to be doing the integral from 0 to pi d theta of 1 over a plus b cosine theta, where 0 is less than b is less than a. This looks like a really difficult integral to evaluate, but there's a couple of tricks that we need to do. The first thing we do is we make the integral go between 0 and 2 pi rather than 0 and pi because it's a periodic function. It's just one half the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the same integrand. And then we do a substitution to map us onto the unit circle. We let z equal e to the i theta. Obviously, the modulus of z is equal to 1, so I'm lying on the unit circle. And then if I calculate d theta, you see if I do dz, I'll get i e to the i theta d theta. But e to the i theta is just equal to z. So if I divide both sides by an iz, I find that dz divided by iz is equal to d theta. So now I'm ready to substitute into this integral. I have an integral around the unit circle of dz divided by iz, 1 over a plus, now I have to write cosine theta. Well, cosine theta is e to the i theta minus e to the minus i, uh, plus e to the minus i theta, the whole thing divided by 2. So I get a b over 2 times z plus 1 over z. Now, this is where we have to really be careful. I might have thought that it could be useful to write e to the minus i theta as the complex conjugate of z, but then I have something that's not an analytic function. But if I write it as 1 over z, so it's still a function of z, then I have something that's still an analytic function. We have our denominator here. I can multiply through by a factor of z that is coming from the i z term, and I get b over 2 z squared plus a z plus b over 2. I can factor a b over 2 out, and then I get z squared plus 2a over bz plus 1. All right, that's a quadratic equation. Let's find its roots. I'm going to call those roots z plus minus, and we just use the quadratic theorem to determine what they are. Minus a over b plus or minus the square root of a squared minus b squared divided by b. Now notice 
if I look at that denominator, you see that the constant term is equal to 1, but the constant term is just equal to z plus times z minus. So I learned that z plus times z minus is equal to 1. That means z plus is equal to 1 over z minus. So if one of the roots lies inside the unit circle, the other root must lie outside the unit circle because their norms are reciprocals of one another. Please be sure you understand that particular result. Now it's possible both roots could lie on the unit circle, but if one lies inside the unit circle, the other must lie outside the unit circle. I'm going to assume that that's actually the case, that one lies inside and one lies outside. And then we'll check at the end to make sure that that's actually true. What we need to do is find the residue of the root that lies inside the unit circle, because the one that lies outside is one that isn't surrounded by this curve that we're integrating over. Okay, so how do we calculate that residue? Well, we can write this quadratic equation as 1 over z minus z plus times 1 over z minus z minus. You can convince yourself, you can actually work it out. Remember, we already said z plus times z minus is equal to 1. You will find out that z plus plus z minus is equal to minus 2a over b. And that then tells you that this identity is true. Now let's plug in what our expression is for calculating the residue. We first have to identify which root lies inside, and since b is less than a, you can convince yourself that the plus root is the one that lies inside the unit circle, and the minus one is outside. So we find the residue is the limit z approaches z plus of z minus z plus over z minus z plus times z minus z minus. I don't need L'Hopital's rule here. I can just cancel the two factors of z minus z plus in the numerator and the denominator, and then take the limit z goes to z plus. I get 1 over z plus minus z minus. That's easy to evaluate. It's twice the square root term. And when all the dust settles, it becomes equal to b divided by 2 square root of a squared minus b squared. Now I have to take that and I have to multiply that by 2 pi i. And then I have to remember that I have an overall factor of 1 over i b. And once again, when all the dust settles, we find that this integral is equal to pi divided by the square root of a squared minus b squared. So now we can actually check, does this integral make sense? If b is equal to 0, I have just the integral of 1 over a from 0 to pi. Well, that just equals pi over a. And indeed, the right-hand side will equal pi over a if b is equal to 0. On the other hand, if b is equal to a, you can see I'm going to have a place where that integral has a singularity where it becomes 0. And it turns out that that singularity is one that I can't integrate. It's a real singularity, and so the integral actually blows up and becomes infinite. And if I look at the answer, I take the limit b approaches a, I get pi over the square root of 0, and that, of course, is infinity. And so it agrees in that limit as well. And so it turns out that this is the correct result for all a and b, as long as a is bigger than b. And this method of evaluating it by residues I think of as almost magic every time I see it. It's really a remarkable method that is being used to evaluate these integrals. And I hope with practice you're going to become efficient and able to do re uh, integrals by residues. It's a really powerful method to put in your bag of tricks for evaluating integrals. If there's one technique that I use often again and again and again in research, it's evaluating integrals by residues. It comes up again and again and again. So that's all that we have for this lecture. It's a little long, but it really is an important result. And being able to see how these examples work, I hope will allow you to work on the homework problems, it gives you a little extra practice, and also work on the problems that we'll have in class as we go over these different kinds of residues.